Stellar Funk is the first song on the album. It's eight minutes and 43 seconds of just like volcanic, orgasmic funk. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, it's like, a great, it's, uh, it's a great track, right? Hello, and welcome to Eclectic Selections, the human music recommendation service. My name is Liam Flanagan, and I will be your musical guide, recommending you the best in music wherever and whenever it came from. We're currently watching our interview series where each month I interview our guest curator and they give us a set of recommendations. Five recommendations. So, now let's go over to either my past or my future self and see what recommendations our guest has. Uh, welcome to Eclectic Selections. Today's guest is Jay Zone, the funk drummer, former hip hop producer extraordinaire. Hi Jay, how are you doing today? Morning, how you how you doing, man? I'm, I'm good, good, I'm good. Good. So you've done a lot in your career. You you've been a sound engineer, you've been a pop producer and a rapper, and then you quit all that. You got you got you got fed up with it and you you wrote an excellent book about Root for the Villain. That's honestly one of my favorite music books. It's it's very amusing, but it's also like I love the fact that it's it's like the opposite of every other book you read about people in, in hip hop. It's like you're all like, Yeah, I made loads of money and look at all my cars and you know, houses and stuff. And you're like, Ah, no, it went completely the opposite way. I, I mean, I remember reading the book and you uh, not maybe not the book, maybe it was on your blog post, but you talk about your dad buying you this drum kit and being like, you clearly miss it, you know, get back to music. Mm -hmm. And now we're, you know, fast forward 10 years and you're playing sessions and you've got the, the do rights, it's an excellent funk band and you're doing like, that's all the, 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 the drum break records as well. That you're making for other producers to, to use. And I feel like you've kind of totally flipped from like where you were at, where you got so fed up and now, you seem like a, a like a person who's very happy in what they're doing. Yeah, no, it was you're absolutely right. I go back about ten, well, I started playing. I start. I got that drum set. My dad bought me that drum set you're talking about two days after my book came out. So all of it happened at the same time. Right. But if you go back to when I was writing the book, I was a pretty I was a pretty miserable man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like. Well, when I was writing it and it was, I was purging it from my system. So actually things were looking up as I was getting the book to a, a good place. But like yeah. before, I, but, but between the time I left hip hop in 08 and started writing the book in 2010, like that time in between there was pretty rough. So yeah, I was pretty yeah. bitter on the music and the book was my way to kind of emancipate myself from that because like when you're honest and candid about it and you put it on paper and you don't pull any punches, you don't hold anything back. It's kind of like a purge. You get it out of your system and then you mm. close the door, you know, and I wrote that book, for, like you said, to, to show people that, you know, not every most music books, especially hip hop are narcissistic in nature and very much driven by I made all this money. Like you got to be an alpha dog. You can't admit that you that things didn't work out. Like that's just not a hip hop thing to do. So I did. <laughs> so I wanted I wanted to show that side. Like the average hip hop artist was on a bus or getting paid no money or five people. Like that was normal. But people think you know that most the majority of artists I knew that was their reality, or at least it was that way sometimes. So I wanted to tell that. You know, but then I also wanted to close the door because I didn't know I was going to be a drummer or get back into music. But I said yeah. I'm going to. I want to move on with my life. To I guess you were I think you were eight years old, right? When you discovered Cool and the Gang. And that's your first recommendation is music is the message by Cool and the Gang. I discovered Cool and the Gang. I must have been about nine. Right. The summer of eighty-nine. Uh, I went to a record store called Breakdown Records in, in Bayside, Queens, where I ended up being a regular for 20 years. And they had Music is the Message. That's the back cover because they autographed, some of the members autographed it, but the front is just the band name and ICE and the, the mm. title. And like, as you see, the back is that. So I have multiple copies of this because <laughs> it's my, my favorite album. But I saw this for $3.99 in the record store and I was like, wow. 
it was like, this is, I didn't know they had any records before Wild and Peaceful. I didn't know that they had yeah. records that were older because they're harder to find. And I was like, wow, this must be really funky if it's older than Wild and Peaceful. And I took that thing home and I went down there to the basement and put it on. And the first song is, is Music is the Message. And I was a bass player then. So I'm just like, damn, that is funky. And did they, they, yeah, they have some, it, have some great bass lines. Yeah, the, the, and then, you know, of course, later becoming a drummer, like George is just my my favorite drummer of all time. And, you know, that breakdown in the middle is basically the DNA of how I play. The way that that break in right in the middle, like the way he plays the bass drum, that's how, that's how I learned how to play. So every step of my way musically, that was the record. Like when, as a bass player, that was my gospel. When I started to become a, a, a hip hop early '90s, I would go there and sample horn bits yeah. and stabs and bait, you know. And then when I became a uh, when I when I was heavy into DJing, I had all that stuff on 45s ready to go, or during Serato or whatever. And then when I became a drummer, I would play to that album like every other day, all 35 minutes. I would just run right through it. And that's how I started to build my chops as a drummer. So everything I ever did musically, there was a cool- You can all back. It, it all goes back to these three, especially, especially these three behind me, the Good Times album, the, the first album, which is, you know, heralded as a classic. Uh, yeah, yeah I, have, I actually have that one on, on vinyl. Yeah, you know, and then I eventually, you know, met these guys in, in recent years and that changed my life you know to meet them and tell them and to get advice from them and you know ronald bell passed away unfortunately and that was a doubt mm -hmm. i was devastated when he passed because i felt like part of me passed i felt like part of me was gone when, when he passed you know but it just it just became part of my life and then i met them and so I'm, the cool in the gang stuff is so deeply ingrained that it's like it's it, it comes out in everything i do like those influences Okay, so we're going to come to now your second recommendation, and like I think this was another formative influence for you in terms of your your sound and, and your bass playing and stuff. As so, is that the concept by Slave? Slave was really what made me want to be a professional musician. I always wanted to be, you know, a musician. I was always into music from the time I was two or three, and I would mess around on instruments. I put, you know. But there was particular focus on any one instrument until I heard Slave. <laughs> and then one day I went to JNR Music World, uh, which is no longer around. It was downtown Manhattan by the Brooklyn Bridge. My dad used to go every Saturday to get Brazilian music and he used to take me with him. And they had a record room in the back for soul, R&B, disco, hip hop. And I was going through the cutout bins and I found a Slave album called The Hardness of the World. Their second album, it was, it was not a commercial success. It was probably the least commercially successful of their early records, but I found it and I took it home. And man, the, the, the bass, I just, the bass playing just jumped out at me. And I noticed on the back cover, I wish I had it with me. I brought the concept, I didn't bring that, but it's downstairs. I don't want to run and get it. It has the bass player, Mark Adams, and he has a red leather pants on and almost like a dashiki kind of a robe. And he's got an Olympic. <laughs> A limbic That's a fun finish. look. <laughs> he's like this with his thumb, but he has a scowl on his face like he's about to slap the E string. Yeah. And I was like, he sounds like he looks. Like the bass playing is so <laughs> nasty and he just looks like, he just looks like a bad, bad, bad dude. Like I, I was like, I want those red leather pants. I want that dashiki. I want that bass. I want everything. I'm going to legally change my name to Mark, <laughs> like <laughs> all that, because this guy is the real deal. And I must have been 10 when that, nine, yeah. nine or 10. And so I discovered the bass. And then like maybe a couple of weeks later, my dad went back to JNR and I went to the slave section and started pulling. And that's when I found the concept. That was the right. second album I, I got from them or the third album that I heard because my mother had one. And, you know, it was three, three, again, it was three ninety nine, And when I looked on the back, there's Mark Adams right there. He's got this black and yellow Charlie Brown looking kind of space outfit on. And the big <laughs> yeah, he looks great. 
and his right hand is actually in the thumb position to, to slap the bass and then the guitar player Drac like he's like looks like he's holding the guitar and they just have these crazy outfits and and I was like yeah this has got to be bad so I went home and played it and Stellar Funk is the first song on the album it's eight minutes and 43 seconds of just like volcanic orgasmic funk <laughs> yeah it yeah it's like, a great it's uh, it's a great track right? what I noticed yeah. about them when I was um when I was doing my research is this they're, they're from Ohio and they, 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 all those bands have their own kind of sound. Yeah, and they had more of a rock influence than the other bands. Like when you listen right. to them, because of the, they had two guitarists, Drac Hicks and Danny Webster. They both passed, rest in peace. And Drac played, Drac's influence was Jimi Hendrix. So they had a lot of electric guitar lead stuff and, uh, and solos. And in funk, that just like, Funk was more like chicka, 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 like chicken yeah, scratch, yeah. Like, all like rhythm, rhythm guitar. You know, yeah. like you didn't hear too much. You didn't hear too much shredding in funk. I mean, mm. a little bit in P funk and stuff like that. Yeah, Eddie like, Hazel. Yeah, Ed, yeah, Eddie Hazel. Like Maggot Brain is probably one of the greatest solos in the history of recorded music. <laughs> sure. Like, Maggot, Maggot Brain will tug at your emotions when you listen to it. It's it's unbelievable, you know. But it is an incredible track. But most of the funk guitarists were chicken scratch, like James Brown, or they were like Sugarfoot when they came out of the blue. That's when I realized there's levels to being a musician. When I bought that Slave album, I got a bass. I got my first bass out of the Sears catalog for $99. And I got my first bass around the time that I found the concept. And when I, I used to learn by playing to records. So I would play along yeah. ear, and that's how I'd figure out positions and keys and and trying to play along to Mark Adams, that's like being in fifth grade and trying to do like a Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. Like you realize there's levels. Yeah, you realize how just how far up you know, and away from you. I had exploded when I, I, I found out later that those guys were still in high school for the first three albums. <laughs> like 16, 17, 18. Mm. And then the time, years later, when I interviewed Steve Arrington, who was the drummer and lead singer, he came at, he came on the concept. He wasn't on the first two albums. He came to the band at that right. time. On the, on the album. And I, and I interviewed Steve for my Red Bull Music Academy column, Give the Drummer Some. Steve is yeah. an awesome person. He's one of the greatest. Got to give a shout out to Steve. Uh, but, you know, I asked him about Mark. He said, Mark only concern was that bass he just he was focused on that bass that that was his thing and he was just into that bass like getting a bass and being into slave at the same time made me realize no you can't do that yet <laughs> like it's gonna take you some time to do it that was when the cognitive that that was when it clicked like no being a musician is work like you can't just stand on stage with a funny outfit and look cool on a cover like this work that this yeah. discipline that goes into he, it. He earned, he earned the, the, the outfit. Huh? Like he basically earned the outfit by pointing there, it out. There you go. That's the best way to put it. Like he's yeah. looking cool with the leather pants and the Olympic, but guess what? That's his 10,000 yeah. hours. Yeah. If he didn't play well, you'd just be laughing right. at him. Right. I could wear that outfit and, and not play well, and then I just look like a clown. But when you play like that and look like that, you look that much doper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, Slave I I was when, agree with that. Slave was the first group I collected the whole collection, and that was the band that made me realize that this, you know, there's levels to stuff. The concept is my favorite album from them overall. But Thank you to you all for watching this video. If you want to support Eclectic Selections and join our community, there are various ways you can do so. Number one, you can comment, like, and subscribe right here on YouTube. This helps this video get noticed and helps other music lovers like yourself discover great music. Number two, you can follow us over on Twitter or even sign up to our newsletter. Here you'll get all the latest news, extra recommendations, plus some humorous and informative conversation. And the final way is to join our Discord community where you can chat with other music lovers and myself. We can talk about music and other topics too. All the links to support Eclectic Selections are below in the description of this video. Thanks again for watching and until next Thursday, keep it eclectic.